www.ncbi.org. Type the author's name in the search bar at the top of the page. Up next on Book TV's Afterwards, former Trump administration strategist Sebastian Gorka offers his thoughts on how the U.S. can strengthen its national security. He's interviewed by Ambassador Paula Dobriansky, former Undersecretary of State for Global Affairs in the George W. Bush administration. Afterwards is a weekly interview program with relevant guest hosts interviewing top nonfiction authors about their latest work. Welcome, Dr. Sebastian Gorka. We're really delighted to have you here today. Thank you. And congratulations on your book. This is fantastic, Why We Fight. And I also hear and understand that in addition to your other accomplishments, that you also have a new one in the queue, that you're the new host, in fact, of America First on uh, Radio Salem Network. Uh, am I correct in saying that? Yeah, absolutely. It's the, the newest national radio show on the Salem Network from California to D.C. Uh, I guess I've become a, a culture warrior, finally. <laughs> uh, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said, you should have a radio show, well, now I do uh, three to six on the East Coast every day from the Salem Radio Network. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Hey, and what about your Twitter? Uh, should we actually stick that in so uh, that anyone I, I who it. wants to tweet yeah. you, yeah. Uh, you we, tweet them? <laughs> it's very easy. It's just Seb Gorka, S-E-B-G-O-R-K-A on Twitter. And in fact, we have a brand new website that goes with the radio, with the radio program, and that's also sebgorka.com that live streams it, has archived materials. So Seb Gorka, follow me. Great. Look, why we fight. Why did you write the book? Tell our viewership. Yeah. So, what, what, what inspired you to write this book? Well, the, and, the, and what's your message? The the important thing is not just why I wrote the book, but also I think the subtitle that I owe to my publisher, Margie Ross at Regnery, who really uh, is a genius in these things. Uh, I, well, I, I came into the White House thinking I was going to work counterterrorism issues because that was my main thing, Al Qaeda, ISIS, and so forth. But then I became a, a general kind of. Um, Bill O'Reilly called me the utility infielder of national security in the White House. And then I realized, once you have the clearances, once you read the classified reports, that terrorism is an issue we will man manage. We will suppress it. But there are other threats. And I wanted to give an unclassified recount to Americans who are interested of what the strategic challenges are that we face today, from China to North Korea to uh, Russia to, to, to all of the non-state actors as well. And then lastly, um, the subtitle is the key thing that I got from Marge. It's why we fight defeating America's enemies with no apologies, which is, of course, a reference to the last eight years under President Obama, when we had an ideologically driven foreign policy that really saw America as the problem. Let's not forget that the last commander in chief almost began his presidency by traveling the world on a so-called apology tour from Cairo to everywhere else saying, whatever the issue is, whether it's poverty, inequality, terrorism, we are the problem. And as such, he built a national security strategy. This is the stunning thing, that in case that the highest level of US government, the concepts of leading from behind and strategic patience, which meant a, a, a withdrawing of America from the, the international stage, and as such, actors like Vladimir Putin exploited that vacuum with the invasion of uh, Ukraine. We saw ISIS grow from a, a little franchised branch of Al-Qaeda into the most successful modern insurgency. So this book is about reasserting American re leadership, being proud of our Judeo-Christian uh, heritage, giving, giving a strategic overview of the threats we face and what Donald Trump is doing about them, because as his former strategist, I have a little bit of uh, a perspective on that. And then lastly, to reinstill in Americans their pride for who we are as the greatest nation on God's earth with four stories. I call these my heroes' vignettes. People who have given their all for this country, going back to Stephen Decatur soon after the founding, right up to Whitaker Chambers, to remind people that, yes, this is who we are and this is what people have done for this country. By the way, we're going to get to the policy side of your book. But you mentioned the, the stories. Yes. Um, I want to tackle first a little bit about your own personal story and that of your heritage, your parents. But we are going to get into those four heroes because it's very striking the way you weave in their stories into also the policy uh, insights that you are putting forward in the book. It was, it was actually a very special part and memorable part of the book. But let's start with this. You know, your first chapter, 
focus on, focuses on what it means to be a freedom fighter. I view your father, who you really tell the story of in the book, about your father. Please tell us what does it mean to be a freedom fighter, and also say a bit about your father, the impact that your father, your parents had on you and your own worldview. I am a product of my parents. Uh, my parents were children in World War II when um, Hungary was taken over, first by a, a puppet uh, Nazi regime and then occupied. They lived through that oppression. Uh, my father actually assisted, protected his fellow Jewish classmates on their way to school to make sure they weren't abused by the occupational uh, Nazi forces. And then as a 15-year-old, he had great hope for his country when he heard the great men had sat down at Yalta and promised democracy and freedom for the occupied countries of Central Europe like Hungary. But as oh, you know better than anybody, given your career and your expertise, those hopes were dashed. By 1948, when he became 18, the Nazis, the fascists, had been replaced with a Stalinist regime that was a satrapy of the Soviet Union, of the Kremlin. And as a patriot, as a man who believed in, in the, the Judeo-Christian values of, of his country, he decided to resist, but not with a gun or a bomb. Uh, in college, he started a secret Christian underground association that would spy on the Soviets, collect sensitive information about how they were stealing the national treasure of Hungary, how they were uh, um, reneging on the requirements of the Yalta Treaty, and smuggle that information out to the West so that some democratic country could use it against Moscow. And they did. For eight months, they successfully did that. They had a courier who would courier out the information to Vienna. But unfortunately, they found a nation that was interested in that information. It was the UK, and it was MI6, the External Intelligence Agency of, of, the, of the UK. And their reports ended up landing on the desk of none other than Kim Philby. Kim Philby, who, if, if you're a history buff, was one of the five deadliest traitors to the West that we have ever seen, the so-called Cambridge Apostles, who were recruited by the Soviets, uh, who uh, penetrated the highest echelons of the British establishment, the intelligence community, the FCO, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And Kim Philby collected these reports until he could identify every single person that was in my father's group, and then he betrayed them to Moscow and to the Hungarian secret police. As a result, at the age of 20, my father was arrested, tortured in the basement of the secret police headquarters in Budapest, su uh, subjected to a show trial, and given a life sentence at the age of 20. He spent two years in solitary, two years down a prison coal mine, and then was eventually liberated in the glorious 11 days of freedom that was the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. And with a 17-year-old uh, daughter of a fellow political prisoner, my father and uh, this girl, Susan, literally crawled across a minefield into free Austria as refugees and eventually settled in the UK uh, and that's where I was born and raised. With that uh, in, my, in my family background, in my gene co code, um, and, and there's, there's a moment I describe in the book where I, I knew very little of this as a child. I grew up speaking Hungarian in England, then I went to school, learned English. But there was a moment, there's a moment, you can sometimes find moments when your life changes. And my parents used to take me to France on holiday as a child. And one day, my father, who's an amazing athlete, he was on the, the national crew team before he was arrested. He loved to swim. He comes out of the ocean, and I'm, I'm eight, nine years old. And I see on him these white lines on his wrists. And he's far too young to be wrinkled. And I said to him, Dad, what's that? And without blinking, with no emotion, he just said, that's where the secret police bound my wrists together with wire behind my back so they could hang me from the ceiling of the torture chamber. That changes your outlook. And as such, from a very early age, I understood that freedom is as fragile as it is precious. And sooner or later, the great Ronald Reagan was always correct when he said, sooner or later, um, the loss of liberty is always but one generation away. Whether it's Nazis in World War II, whether it's the Soviets of the Cold War, or whether it's jihadis, they're all connected, they're all totalitarians, they worship different 
um, focal points of, 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 of their ideology. But we always have to be prepared for the next totalitarians, and, and that's another reason why I opened the book with that story. Well, I have to say it was very gripping and very uh, memorable uh, in terms of the description uh, and how that impacted your life and how you began that way in terms of what does it mean to be a freedom fighter and use the example of your father in that context. Now, you know, you go on and you argue that the most important ingredient for victory is a will right. to win that is greater than your enemies. I mean, that to me was really one of the thematic underpinnings right. of the book. And you basically say that too, all too often we forget this eternal truth. Yeah. Please, for our, 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 our viewership, talk about this because yeah. this is a crucial aspect of why we fight. Yeah, it's, it's perhaps the most important uh, facet of any conflict. And this isn't Sebastian Gorka. This is Sun Tzu two and a half millennia ago. This is uh, Karl von Clausewitz, the, the, the master of Western strategic thought. Um, there's, there's a reason why Sun Tzu, for example, says the, the ultimate victory is to win without fighting. Now, now, what does that mean? Is that an oxymoron? No, it means your will is so great, or you communicate that your will to win is so powerful that your adversaries say, oh, we're just not going to even try to take this person on. You, you psych out the opposition. There's a reason why Clausewitz uses some very um, symbolic images in his writing on war when he says war is about two human beings. Uh, it can be two people playing cards with each other or it can be two men wrestling, but at the end of the day, it's about one side imposing its will on the other. And the point is a very simple, simple one. Um, we are the most powerful nation the world has ever seen. By any metric right now, the US economy under Donald Trump is, is the largest it has ever been. We are now exporting energy, which is incredible. Uh, we are not just a superpower. I agree with Francois Eisbourg, the, the French author, who says we are a hyperpower. We have no peer competitors if you look at the classic measurements of, uh, of state power. So what? Does that mean we can defeat whoever we want? We have the best soldiers, the best marines, the best airmen, the best technology, the best training. Okay, well, let's look at Vietnam. Let's look at Afghanistan. Uh, in, in the first six years of the war, the most effective tool used against us in Afghanistan was what? An IED. Not exactly high tech. It's an artillery shell with some wires sticking out of it. Uh, the idea that we could have a serious problem with people who are using pre-modern technology to fight us tells you what you need to know. If you have the will to win at all cost, then it sometimes neutralizes the technological uh, advantage, the financial advantage your adversary may have. So this book is as much about the will to win. And I think, I think we currently have a commander in chief who is demonstrating that uh, amply. Well, we're going to get to that more in depth, but yes. I want to take the viewership through pieces mm -hmm. uh, because of your book, because yes. there are very focused pieces. You refer to history. You look at a number of these threats and why we fight and why it matters. And on this issue about ideas, let me also go to another area that you really focus on that's interrelated and very much connected to the battle of ideas. You also mentioned that, quote, without an America of heroes ready to fight and win, that you know our fate basically will fall into the hands of totalitarian regimes. Let's talk about uh, the issue of the fight against terrorism mm -hmm. in this regard. And I do want to go to some of the heroes and their stories, how it's interrelated. But you've already referenced uh, the issue of the kind of uh, um, challenge and threats that the United States is, is facing. We're positioned. We have uh, uh, assets. But where do ideas come into play in terms of the fight against terrorism? Uh, they're central. They're absolutely central. Uh, the, the threats we face are always couched by the other side in terms of an ideology. Again, whether it's fascists, communists, whether it's Iran, the, the, the mullahs, whether it's ISIS, uh, they always have to have a framework in which they justify their strategy. 
For Hitler, it was what? It was his fascist ideology that said, we're going to blame a minority, we're going to blame the Jews, they're undermining Germany, we must exterminate them all, then we will be great again. For the communists, it was what? It was the capitalists, it was the, the people who are exploiting the working class, we must have a global revolution and we must create this workers' paradise. For the jihadists, it's their interpretation of the religion that they see as being the only religion. People miss this. When a terrorist, we've just seen it in the UK, when they shout Allah Wakbar, it doesn't actually mean Allah is great. It is Allah is greatest. He is greater than any other. And it is a supremacist ideology. Um, I, don't th I, I feel a little embarrassed that I'm sitting here with you, Paula, and I'm going to talk about the Cold War. I mean, if anybody knows the role of ideas. When did we start to understand the Cold War and the existential threat it posed to us? You can mark it on a diary with exactitude. It's when George Kennan writes a 14-page classified long telegram to Washington when they say, when Washington says to him, look, what's up with Uncle Joe? We thought he was our friend. And then this man who had been steeped in Russian history and also the ideas of the Soviet revolution, sits down and he explains it to everybody. This is a system that posits that its ideology, socialism, cannot peacefully coexist with democracies. As such, it is only logical that for them, they must enslave or destroy anybody who is not a socialist. At that point, because of the explication of the ideas of the enemy, finally the Truman administration understood this is an existential threat and we get to Paul Nietzsche, we get to NSC 68, and we have a grand strategy to respond to that threat. It's like a doctor. If you can't diagnose the ailment, you will not be able to heal that person. Diagnosing an ailment in conflict begins with understanding your enemy and what they believe. In fact, significantly in the book, you <laughs> well document everything that you've mentioned, but you also dive deep into the Reagan administration. Yes of which I was uh, part of and had the privilege of serving on the National Security Council staff at a very, very striking moment in history. And you document how the ideology shifted from the whole thesis of containment yes. uh, to rollback. Right. Um, what do you think is the best way forward? Hasn't there been a kind of complacency internationally? Now I'm not speaking of the United States, but internationally. Some argue that uh, some in Europe have taken the position that, well, you know, we're in a post-Cold War period, right. and yes, there are challenges, but, you know, we have our structures, we have our institutions. Is there a kind of complacency? How can we win in the battle of ideas? This what is are a, our this assets? Is a, this is a one-hour show, am I correct? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's, I'll try and crunch the four-hour answer down. Absolutely. Uh, complacency, arrogance, and lack of expertise. I, I talk a lot to my, my friends left in the UK. The people who understand the importance of ideas or ideology or totalitarian ideology, they, ha they have nothing to do with government. They, they don't work for 10 Downing Street. They don't work for the MOD. They have no way to shape the strategic culture of that nation. Uh, here with, with John Bolton, we finally have somebody who understands who's right at the top of the system inside the National Security Council. H.R. McMaster didn't. He wanted tanks. He wanted big footprints ac across Afghanistan. Um, so, yes, so l let, me, let me try and um, e explain what, what the challenge here is. Fukuyama couldn't have been more wrong if he tried. Uh, the, it's really quite a parody that the Meaning the end of history. Yes. I okay. mean, it's quite... To it's, let our viewers shift to make yeah. sure they know. Sorry. I mean, it's quite a parody that the 1990s was shaped by two articles. Really, the whole 1990s was a debate between Huntington, the Clash of Civilizations, and Francis Fukuyama. Now, um, Huntington was misrepresented in most cases. He didn't actually say it's a clash of civilizations. It's war between the marginal areas between civilizations. But Francis's book said ideology is dead. It's irrelevant. Democracy is one, and the future of mankind is going to be uh, fine-tuning the graphic equalizer of market democracies. It's actually um, a Marxist argument. It's a totally materialistic argument that, that, uh, that goes back to the ideas of Hegel and, and the dialectic. The idea that a neoconservative fell into Hegel and the dialectic trap and told us ideology is irrelevant, ask Maduro, ask the mullahs, ask the people suffering under the Yutse regime of North Korea whether ideology is dead. 
of course, uh, ideology is what motivates people, ideas. Ideology, if you translate it from the original French word, means a set of beliefs that informs action. Francis, when are, when are beliefs going to stop being relevant? So, um, yes, we have been in a malaise. I, I think the last time America was truly strategic was under your administration, when, when you worked for, uh, for President Reagan. That's when we understood this. Now, finally, after January the 20th, 2017, you know, we, we have an administration that uh, thinks and acts strategically. I, I think the national security strategy that was penned by um, Nadia Shadlow is the first NSS since the Reagan administration that deserves to use the adjective strategic. So we, you're right, we, we, were in, uh, we were lurching for the snooze button for about 30 years. Well, uh, indeed, and by the way, I must uh, comment on that national security uh, strategy. Uh, strategy. Uh, truly, it is strategic, it's well articulated, and Dr. Shadlow did a really She did. I was in the meetings, she work. did a great incredible job. Incredible work. Great job. Let me go to another sub-theme yes. that you have that's, again, very much interrelated to your opening uh, comments. You argue that we need to adjust our fighting systems to deal with the uh, resurgence of the older, more traditional types of conflict. And then at the same time, you argue the need for maintaining our readiness. Um, you also point out how information and technology have changed the very practice of, you know, how um, the public response to war is even talked about. Explain this. Yeah. And also, I want to weave in, because you have those wonderful vignettes of these heroes, you have, after this particular section in the book, you have Stephen Decatur. Yes. I mean, it's truly phenomenal, you know, in terms of his story, I mean, being the youngest captain ever, ever right? And just what he did. So please weave right. that story into your response to my question. Well, first things first. So before I came to the White House, um, I had a company called Threat Knowledge Group, and I traveled, I did 20,000 miles a month traveling from military base to military base to FBI headquarters, giving briefings on ISIS and irregular warfare. And the one chart I used that always garnered the greatest attention in the DOD and elsewhere was um, from an article I wrote with David Kilcullen uh, mapping the last 200 years of, of warfare. There's something at the University of Pennsylvania called the Correlates of War Project that has collected all the key data on every war since Napoleon. We applied a taxonomy to it, and we took those 460 wars, and we separated them into conventional wars, where nations fight each other, like World War I, mm -hmm. and wars in which there was an unconventional opponent, a non-state actor, an insurgent group, a terrorist group. And we found something stunning. Paul, in the last 200 years, 80% of all conflict in the world has been unconventional. T less than 20% was the kind of thing we think of when we say World War II. Tanks fighting tanks, uh, dog fights of jet fighters. 80% of all warfare is when we're fighting a non-state actor. Mm -hmm. And of course, for us, this should not be a surprise. And I'm not talking about Vietnam or the Taliban. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the founding of our country. We were born in irregular warfare. The colonialists running around mm -hmm. sniping at red coats, that's irregular warfare. Not only that, to go to Stephen Decatur, there is a reason the Marine Corps anthem has the line, the shores of Tripoli in it. And it isn't be because, you know, the, the, the devil dogs like to go on holiday to North Africa. It's because one of the first ever covert missions of this nation was when 20 Marines uh, traveled with four ships into the North African uh, arena to recapture a vessel, the USS Philadelphia, that had been taken hostage by the Barbary pirates and by the kingdom of Tripoli. Uh, we, ha because we had no navy after we were founded, our ships were prey to the Barbary pirates, who were what? Muslims. They were jihadists. For years, we had to pay tribute. Uh, American sailors were captured, were enslaved, until a man called Thomas Jefferson becomes the commander-in-chief, and he says, we are not a tributary nation. We will take back our ship. And he deploys a tiny flotilla with this 24-year-old young officer, and he is the man who, under disguise, leads this band of Marines into the shores of Tripoli, into the harbor, to recapture the USS Philadelphia. He couldn't recapture it, so he scuttled it, 
and, and as a result of that brave action, which was recognized by the Pope as the, the greatest act of any nation for Western civilization of recent times, uh, Thomas Jefferson made him, to this day, the youngest ever naval captain in US history. And, and the whole point of this, beyond heroes trying mm -hmm. to you know, point the finger at great heroes, is to illustrate that our war with the jihadi movement did not begin on September the 11th or on the first World Trade Center attack or on the USS Cole. Our war with the jihadists is almost as old as the Republic itself. It's amazing. It's amazing. And the way you wove that story in and the message that it sends. Um, let me also go to, uh, we've, we've, dis we've discussed a bit also, which is a recurring theme in the book about how, quote, war isn't just about guns and bombs uh, when ideas kill. That uh, was, you know, one of the important messages. Yes. And you mentioned Clausewitz, and you do have Clausewitz uh, peppered throughout here, and how he was correct that all war is a battle of wins. Um, you also point out that propaganda yes. matters. Absolutely. Right? That's, you know, uh, uh, here, the Cold War, we've touched upon that. Um, but what what is a winning strategy mm. and mm -hmm. weaving in yeah. propaganda? Describe that. What do you think is a winning uh, strategy? I, I don't want to sound like a, a broken record, but I, I grew up under Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and, and for me, there is a, a, a petri dish test case of how you do it correctly. And that is the Active Measures Working Group from the Reagan administration. And it's, it's one of the examples of, I truly believe in small is beautiful. Uh, giant bureaucracies, another interagency committee. No, you have a small band of people who have the support of the president who are crossed between the, 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 the NSC, their staff is from the Hill, the intelligence community, uh, Voice of America, and they come together and what do they do? They create an entity which is going to shine a bright light on the lies of the enemy. And, and one of the best examples is, do you remember, it's still an urban legend that the United States uh, you know, Fort Detrick created AIDS, and it was used to target ethnic minorities. This, this is out there in the, in, the, in the conspiracy theory domain. Well, this was actually goes back to the Active Measures Working Group, because there was, a, there was this uh, idea that America is using biological warfare against minorities. What did the Active Measures Working do, gr Group do? They traced that story back to an African journalist who was the first person ever to float this idea that AIDS is artificial. And then they went and they talked to this journalist. And what did they find out? They asked him what his source was. And he said, oh, I was at a reception and a Soviet diplomat gave me that information. <laughs> it's propaganda. That is the essence of propaganda, shaping the information environment. So that's what they did. You, you have to delegitimize the purveyor of the lies and show their lies for what they are. With regards to the current threat we face, I've said for years now, with the global jihadi movement, we have to work with our Arab and Muslim allies, primarily the Jordanians and the Egyptians, to do what? To, to help them undermine the ideology of global jihadism. Because we can kill as many jihadis as we like. I, the DDO, the Deputy Director of Operations in the Pentagon told me a few years ago, if I know where a high value target is, a jihadi, and I have Secretary of Defense or POTUS uh, presidential sign off, we can kill him in 72 hours wherever he is in the world. We can reach out with an alpha team, with JSOC, with a, with a UAV, and we will kill them. Okay, great. But what happens if the day after you drone that person, 20 young jihadis volunteered to replace him. You've just created a cycle. I, I describe it as exquisite whack-a-mole. Um, if you want to win, you do what Sun Tzu said. You win without fighting. So ultimate victory in a war of ideas is when the ideology of becoming a jihadi is no longer sexy. It's no longer attractive when it doesn't actually act as a magnet for young men and women around the world. And that can only be done with counter propaganda. You also cite here in this section another hero, and this hero is Louis, Louis Chesty Puller. Puller. Yeah. Um, he's, I understand that he's the only American awarded the U.S. Army <laughs> Distinguished Service Cross yeah. and Navy Cross five, five times. times. Right. Okay. Right. So take a moment yeah. 
just tell the story of, uh, of Chesty Puller yeah. and how that you know, exemplifies or brings out this very thesis uh, well, that you described. Well, I, I spent two and a half glorious years teaching at, at the Marine Corps University in Quantico, and there's a reason why the cadences in Quantico, Lejeune, and elsewhere still call out Chesty Puller's name. This is a man who, who tried without his parents' permission to, to join the army at the age of 16 or 17. Finally, he enrolled in VMI uh, when he was 18, ended up in the Marine Corps as a corporal, multiple, multiple engagements as a corporal overseas. But the story I tell in the book is the story of Guadalcanal and Henderson Field. A, a, a battle most people have never heard of, but was absolutely crucial to the island hopping strategy we used in, in, in the uh, Pacific theater. In Hen Henderson Field was a small airfield in Guadalcanal that we had captured. And it was Chesty Puller's unit that he was commanding of Marines that was securing this base with no organic reserves, no capacity to reinforce them organically from the core. In a battle that lasted three days in which the Japanese uh, not only bombed the field, not only shelled the field from the sea, but also launched literal waves of combatants against the Marines. This is the commander who never swayed in his capacity to keep his men's morale high. He made sure, the small things, making sure that they were clean shaven, making sure that any man who wanted to have a, a, a service, a, a Catholic Protestant service, what have you, to keep their morale high, was allowed access to that chaplain. And as such, uh, I think the figures uh, I record, two and a half thousand Japanese killed with maybe two dozen Marines uh, injured or killed. Th this, is, this is just the example of how leadership at a tactical level can have a strategic effect and how one airfield in the Asia Pacific turned around the war for us in a way that is unimaginable in, in terms of uh, the, the over-technologized uh, way we look at war today. It, it's, it's, it's an attempt uh, to illustrate the importance of leadership. Excellent. You also, uh, in one of the chapters, you really focus quite a bit on what do you need to know about war? Right, right. And let me just tick down. You do mention the nature. You have to know about the nature of our enemy enemies. You know, what are the long-term objectives? What are the specific threats to the United States at home or abroad? And do we have the right tools to keep our nation safe? Yeah. Um, let's dive deep into that. Uh, this, is, this is a crucial part also of your book because it's it's, of course, there's strategy, but there are also these basics that you need to have in order to define your strategy. Let me start by, by quoting my old professor from, from the Kennedy <laughs> School at, at Harvard. He, he has a superb lecture online at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab where he talks about this august committee that he was uh, asked to attend. And Graham Allison was part of this group that was looking at the, the national interests of the United States. And after their final meeting, this august body had listed 103 vital national interests to America. And as Graham said, as it says in his lecture, when you've got 103 vital interests, you have none. And he's absolutely right. Being strategic means prioritization. The first thing you have to do, you have to know the enemy, but people forget the, the first part of that quote from Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu did not say, if you want to win, know your enemy. No, he said, if you know your enemy, you will win half your battles. If you wish to win all your battles, you must know yourself and why you are fighting as well as know the enemy. People, for some reason, forget that. And this is why we've had the strategic malaise of the last 20, 25 years, because we haven't really looked at what we are and what is important to us. Um, let, me, let me illustrate this with one thing, Afghanistan. When we deployed to Afghanistan in October of 2001, there was one strategic mission, and one alone. It wasn't building hospitals. It wasn't rebuilding the ring, round around, ring road around Kabul that not even the Soviets ever managed to finish. It's one reason alone. That piece of real estate in Central Asia must never, ever again be used to launch, launch mass casualty attacks against Americans on US soil, period. And the first mission we had of uh, JSOC elements and CIA paramilitaries was absolutely stunning unconventional warfare because with 300 guys on, on, on donkeys 
with you know, real-time laptop targeting equipment, we leveraged more than 20,000 Northern Alliance, not only to take out the Al-Qaeda training facilities, but also to eventually to take down the Taliban. So this, this is followed by what? 17 years of mission creep. We're going to turn this country into a functioning representative democracy. It's going to have an economic growth. There's going to be uh, freedom and liberty for women and minorities. Without understanding, that's not our strategic goal. Why does Afghanistan matter to America? I, my parents lived under a dictatorship. I want everybody to be free. I want women to go to school. I want music not to be illegal, as it was under the Taliban. But at the end of the day, strategy is unemotional. And the, Afghanistan's importance to us is what? It must never again be used as a launching pad for mass casualty attacks against US citizens. This is what we lost. It's that, that capacity to think and act strategically, not to make what we've seen in the, in the national security strategies of the last 20 years, which is what? A laundry list. We're going to do everything. We're going to save the whale, make sure the ice caps don't melt. We're going to have two theater wars at the same time. No. To be strategic, you must know who you are and what you're fighting for. And on that point, if I may, the most important speech the president has given to date is the Warsaw speech. There is a reason. We, we, we requested that the Polish government not hold that speech in some fancy protocol building downtown. We wanted the president of the United States to stand next to the statue of the Warsaw Uprising, to send a signal to the people around the world, this is who we are. And that speech is about one thing. America is back, and we are proud of our Judeo-Christian heritage, and we will stand shoulder to shoulder with any nation that shares our values, be it Poland, be it Israel, be it anybody else. The, the homework of the strategist always begins at home. By the way, uh, Graham Allison was also my professor at Harvard, and I'm not surprised by the clarity <laughs> of thought. And I had not heard that one, but it's, a uh, great video. But it's wonderful. And secondly, I happened to be there in Warsaw when uh, President Trump Wonderful. delivered that speech. And it was quite riveting, and the messages were extremely clear. You well document in the book the whole case of Afghanistan, and as you've just articulated it here uh, today. One of your third heroes comes up in yes. this context, and this one is Eugene Red McDaniel, an American hero who never gave in. Yeah, this is the, the chapter uh, I've had grown men tell me this is the, this is the <laughs> chapter that makes them cry. And uh, I'm not surprised. I've met uh, Captain McDaniel. I was honored to meet him uh, three years ago. This is somebody who's not well known. He sent me his autobiography called uh, Scars and Stripes. And it's an incredible tale. This is a man who was a naval aviator, had flown dozens of missions over Vietnam, and he was shortly before being um, able to be shipped back home. And he gets shot down um, in, in what is called White Knuckle Alley on his last mission. Seriously injured, captured by the, the local uh, Viet Cong. Eugene Red McDaniel spent six and a half years in the Hanoi Hilton. And his story is remarkable because this is a man who had his Parents were poor uh, sharecroppers. He had a rather simplistic, unsophisticated faith. But in the Hanoi Hilton, he, he truly found the, the meaning of faith, the identity of his creator. And, and he, f he finally understood the message of the New Testament in terms of the, the, the meaningfulness of suffering. When he was lying there with his shoulder out of his socket, separating sores on his legs, constantly being interrogated, and they brought in another downed pilot who was even worse off than him. And he suddenly realized, it's not about me, it's about helping my fellow American. And he basically became the minister inside the Hanoi Hilton to his fellow Americans. He held Bible study from the, what he could remember from, from his time uh, back in, a, in the, the United States. And the remarkable story is that he helped develop the, the covert communication system for the prisoners. They had a system of tapping out on a grid, a kind of Morse code, because the most important thing was to know that your fellow man is on the other side of that wall. I'm not alone. That's what kept people alive. And a group of inmates from the Hanoi Hilton attempted an escape, which he was not a part of. 
but after it was uh, foiled, he was interrogated. And this man, Eugene Red McDaniel, in order to save his fellow men who he knew would die if they were interrogated because of the state they were in, he took the responsibility upon himself. He said the breakout plan was his, and he took their suffering onto himself, just as our Lord did. And, and it's, it's a remarkable story. And the great ending to this story is, eventually he's reunited with his wife, his children, and what does the U.S. Navy do for this naval a uh, aviator? They put him back in uniform. They give him his own ship to command. And Eugene Red McDaniel serves again in the U.S. Navy. So th these are the true heroes uh, of, of this great nation. And uh, th there's a moment from his biography where he said, the, the one thing I never doubted was my country or my mission. Amazing story. Really amazing story. Let's go now to the present in yes. the sense of the Trump administration and applying the very purpose of the book, the, the, the messages that you articulate throughout, and really looking at uh, where the administration is on why we fight, yeah. what it means. And you referred to earlier uh, the National Security uh, Strategy document. In that document, it articulates very clearly that we have ge geopolitical competitors. Yes. It cites China, it cites Russia. There's also well articulated the whole issue of global jihadism. Yep. So let's take what you've said and apply it to these. What's happening? What is the administration doing in these different areas and applying it practically? Well, um, I think the easiest way, uh, two, two quick bumper stickers, one may be okay. very, very familiar to you, a peace through strength is our, is our first philosophy or, or the White House's philosophy. And the second one that I applied when I was in the White House all the time, it's not an accident that we had three very senior Marines in the administration as Chief of Staff, uh, as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and as Secretary of Defense. And uh, interestingly, they, they weren't just three Marines. They'd come from the same division in the Marine Corps. And that division has a very uh, telling motto, and their motto is, no better friend, no worse enemy. And I said, that could be the bumper sticker for the Trump administration. American leadership is back. If you wish to be our friend, we will stand by you. If you're our enemy, watch out. And uh, when it comes to the threats I list in the book, or, or the NSS, Nadia's uh, S uh, NSS, um, I'll be very clear here. We can deal with all the threats we face uh, with relative ease. We can contain Iran. Uh, North Korea seems to be going in the right direction. Russia is not a strategic threat. It is a, it is a what I call an anti-status quo actor that wants to destabilize as many parts of the world to its own benefit. But if you look at its uh, dem demography, if you look at its economics, this is a country that is losing 600,000 people a year, are dying in Russia more than are being born. They are in a tailspin. With the president's energy policy, this is a one-horse town that, that runs on what? Gas and, and uh, uh, oil exports. Uh, they, are, they are not a superpower, as was the Soviet Union. They can seriously destabilize things, but they're not a superpower. As such, there is one strategic th level threat we face, and that's China. And uh, China, your viewers don't have to take my word for it. You don't need a clearance. Go to your favorite search engine and just type in one belt, one road. One Belt, One Road is the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party's avowed strategic plan to displace America by the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Revolution for 2049 and to become the world's most powerful hegemonic power. And they are doing it on all, with all instruments of national power, revitalizing their military, building these fake atolls, these military bases in the South China Sea, using economic warfare from Afghanistan. They own the largest copper mine in the world, which is in Afghanistan, now belongs to the Chinese state, whether it's in Africa with uh, rare earth minerals, or whether it's with uh, espionage in the US that is costing us billions of dollars every day, or go back to political warfare, go back to propaganda, the so-called Confucius Institutes across the country that are propagating a fundamentally anti-Western, anti-Judeo-Christian uh, ideology to the unwitting people. Good news is, Paula, the president had a certain attitude to China when he came in. He said, their money is green too, so let them invest. We gave him four uh, top secret briefings on what China is really doing in America. 
and uh, he very rapidly came around and he now understands and that's why we have the tariffs, that's why we have the 302 investigation. Uh, the commander-in-chief understands the threat to America and he is dealing with it. In this section, you bring in Whitaker Chambers. Yes. And as you cite, you said, the one man against the world. Uh, tell briefly his story yeah. and how that relates to uh, uh, literally this, this whole thing of why we win. I, I couldn't know it at the time when I wrote the book because I, 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 you know, I don't, I'm not a soothsayer. Um, but Whitaker Chambers' inclusion has a lot to do with politics today, especially because of the Kavanaugh hearing. Whitaker Chambers, for those who aren't familiar with him, uh, wrote the book Witness, a truly life-changing book. And he was the man who had been a Soviet agent before World War II. He was the courier that took classified information from assets here in America and smuggled it to the Soviet Union. He was the middleman for all the moles uh, here in the East Coast. During World War II, after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, after Stalin got in bed with Hitler, he saw the light. He said, how can this system that I so adored uh, now work with Hitler? And he left the Communist Party. He went underground. He feared for his life. He took his family with him. But he kept all the uh, documentation of his work for the Soviet Union. After the war ended, he, he had found uh, Jesus. He found a love for this country. And he said, I have a duty to help the Truman administration know the moles inside the U.S. government and the elite on the East Coast. And uh, nobody was interested. The White House wasn't interested. The FBI wasn't interested until he found a certain congressman called Richard Nixon on Capitol Hill who was very interested. And uh, as such, Whitaker Chambers became the man who testified for the first time ever in, in live hearings of its sort on Capitol Hill where he said, I am a former communist. I know where the agents of influence are. And one of them is Al Jahis, that man over there. Al Jahis, who had been at Yalta, who had been one of the highest members of the US administration, who was a doyen of the left, a, a, a darling in all the right foundations, writing all the right uh, articles, was, of course, he denied it. And he was championed by the left. And because he was so, so adored, by, by the Democrats, what did they do to Whitaker Chambers? They accused him of everything under the sun. They accused him of being a homosexual, an alcoholic. They accused Whitaker Chambers of being responsible for his brother's death. What did he do? He never gave up. He stood there and he said, despite him actually believing that the Soviet Union would eventually destroy us, he, he had a, a kind of dark expectation of the future. He thought we'd lost our will to fight. He said, I don't care what it costs me, I'm going to tell the truth. So if you're surprised at what happened to Judge Kavanaugh, don't be, because we've seen this come from the left since 1948, the 1950s. This has been going on for half a century. And the point about Whitaker Chambers is Al Jahis went to prison, not for being a Soviet mole, but for perjuring himself. But in the 1980s, when the Venona intercepts of Soviet intelligence have finally declassified, what did we find? We found the conclusive proof that Al Jahis was, in fact, an agent of the Kremlin. Just one example of the human fortitude that some have to stand up to the truth, whatever it costs them personally. By the way, thank you. During this interview, I'm delighted that we could take a bit of time and go through those four heroes that you cite in the book because I found it truly uh, most interesting, not only because you connect them to the points that you uh, tried to get across, but also just their stories in of themselves are just very rich and very moving. One of the things coming back to the current administration, one of the things you pose is the question of, is America safe? Yeah. So is America safe? What's our paradigm now? Metrics matter. Metrics really, really matter. Um, there, are the, there are obvious metrics. We haven't had a mass casualty attack on US soil in the last 18 years. That, that must be notched up. Uh, but on other metrics, we've seen what? We've seen China grow at such a rate, uh, thanks in a large part to us, 
there's a very disturbing trend happening right now, especially in Silicon Valley. The idea that Google not only decided to build its first world-class artificial intelligence facility in China, Google, the most powerful information management platform we have ever seen. I mean, Gutenberg's press is irrelevant by comparison. Google now is assisting the communist regime in Beijing in censoring information from its own people. This administration is not about regime change. This is not a neoconservative administration. But we understand, as Reagan did, that our foreign policy must be informed by a moral compass. We don't invade other countries to change them into versions of ourselves. But if, if the founding, if 1776, if the Declaration of Independence is to mean something, then there must be a moral content to our foreign policy. So um, there are very serious strategic th threats left. China today, why, why is this is now declassified? How is it that in the Midwest we pick up a, a Chinese agent in a cornfield stealing corn from a plantation? Why a corn plantation? Because it's genetically modified corn that has been developed by an American company at the cost of millions, maybe billions, and this Chinese, Chinese agent who was arrested and prosecuted was stealing samples of that product, that intellectual property, to take back to China to reverse engineer it. How many Americans know that we have Chinese agents running around farms in America stealing intellectual property? So uh, on the one hand, we're, we, we are safer. Um, and I'll say one thing on the terrorist threat, if I may, a personal request. There is no front line in the war today. When it comes to global jihadism, the idea that the front line is 8,000 miles away in Mesopotamia or in some, some valley in the Hindu Kush. No, the front line is when you leave your house in the morning whether you're going to a Christmas party in San Bernardino or whether you're going to a nightclub in Florida, the front line is when you leave the door of your home every morning. So all Americans need to be slightly more aware, as, as law enforcement professionals say, have your head on a swivel uh, because you know you could be the person who spots the next threat and you could save some lives if you tell the authorities when you see something suspicious. We have time for two more questions. Yes. Uh, we've really covered a lot of ground and really hit upon a lot of your points in the uh, conveyed in the book. I have to say it's uh, delightful to meet somebody who does an interview who's read the book. It's not always the case. It's not always the case. It's not always the case. I think that's important to read the book. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, we began with I asked you what was your message. Yes. Now, with our viewership, as we can almost conclude the interview. Um, what message do you want to convey to, yeah. the, to the, the viewership? It's very simple. It's very simple. There is only one nation in human history that was ever founded on the principle of individual liberty and freedom, and that is our nation. Every other nation is an accident of history based upon a, a dynastic uh, royalty, an ethnic group, uh, some kind of uh, local war. No, here we are based on the principle that we are all made in God's image, and that is where our innate human dignity comes from. There's a reason the word creator with a capital C is in our founding document. So number one, this is the greatest nation on God's earth. We are different, and we need to return to what Ronald Reagan called us, which is the shining city on the hill. And uh, my second message is, finally, after eight years of self-loathing, self-hatred, and blaming America for the ills of the world, uh, under President Donald J. Trump, we are finally returning to that place as the shining city on the hill. And by the way, I still have one last question. Yeah. But by the way, share with our viewership, again, your tweet. Oh, sure. <laughs> your yeah. Twitter yeah. account. Yeah. Yeah. And also the fact that you're going to be on uh, the radio uh, Salem every network every day as a host. Uh, yeah. But tell uh, your tweet. Thank you. So my, my Twitter <laughs> handle is very easy. It's the abbreviation of my name, Seb Gorka, S-E-B. G-O-R-K-A, and I'm a Monday to Friday, 3 to 6 across the nation, uh, Eastern Time, 3 to 6 across the nation on the Salem Radio Network, and you can listen to us 24-7 on my new website, which is sebgorka.com, S-E-B-G-O-R-K-A.com, and the uh, show is called America First. All right, good, just in case if they missed it on the front end. My final question to you, yeah. we began with your father, and as I said to you, I was very moved by reading that section. I, I knew some pieces about your background,
but it was very, very moving. I was also moved by just your own inspirational words about you. And you, at the very end of the book, you talk about how you mm. felt <laughs> coming into the White yeah. House in the NSC, your yeah. own story. Let's conclude on that note. Just say a few words about what that meant to you, because yeah. it certainly also jumped out at me, if I may say, I felt it was a great privilege during my tenure when I worked as on the NSC staff and during the Reagan administration, and there's nothing like it. No. It's, it's undescribable. Yeah. Share that with our viewership. Well, uh, I met candidate Trump in the summer of 15 when I get a call from his then campaign manager saying, uh, we have a big Republican debate in the fall on national security and Mr. Trump would like to meet with you. So I flew to New York, sat down in uh, Mr. Trump's office then with uh, Corey Lewandowski in the corner, and he was closer to me than you are, and we had this 40-minute blue sky, wide-ranging discussion on national security from the Civil War up to ISIS, nuclear weapons. It was clear that this man has a great interest in these issues. Uh, and in classic Trumpian style, halfway through the conversation, he stopped, looked at Corey and said, I like this guy. Let's hire him. I mean, it's classic Trump. He sees something, he decides. And so I became an advisor on the outside to candidate Trump and then got to know his team, got to know Mike Flynn. Uh, then my wife and I were invited onto the official transition team before the election. I worked in the NSC branch. Uh, my wife worked in the DHS branch. And then um, I was invited, I thought, to work on the NSC on counterterrorism issues. The week of the inauguration, Steve Bannon says, you're coming to work for me in the office of the chief strategist. OK. And then the day after the inauguration, I say, well, it's a Saturday, but I'm now a government employee. So I went to the White House in an unmarked van driven by a, a, a young black um, uh, uh, um, female army driver, arrive at the EEOB, the Eisenhower Building, get my blue pass, walk into a West Wing that is <laughs> utterly empty at 8 a.m. the day before, day after the inauguration. And, and I asked the Secret Service uh, uniformed agent at, at the door, um, so where am I allowed to go? And she said, well, you've got a blue badge wherever you want. There's me, a legal immigrant to the United States, working in the White House, only in America, Paula, only in America. Indeed. Dr. Sebastian Gorka, thank you so much for coming. His book is Why We Fight, Defeating America's Enemies with No Apologies. Thank you again, and congratulations to you. You're too kind. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Here are some of the current best-selling nonfiction audiobooks according to Audible. 